my first time at Humana. I was in the Mother Lodge Festival uh, maybe five years ago, uh, which is like the off, off, off Broadway version of Humana. <laughs> and uh, I thought I came over to Humana just to get a sense of it, and I thought I had experienced it, but I I realized that I have not experienced it because I hadn't stayed at the hotel. Because <laughs> the hotel is amazing. <laughs> I'm sure you have a diversity panel at some point during this festival, because they always do. And I think you should take the panel and just sit in the lobby. <laughs> and just watch, because nowhere else on the planet will you see 40 men in wheelchairs collide with the women's basketball team. <laughs> What I find really amazing about it is it's knowledge sharing. That is the new arts administrative phrase that I've learned this week, knowledge sharing. Um, we're all sharing, we're in a knowledge sharing economy, or at least we're trying to be. And the hotel is knowledge sharing. I was, I was on uh, the elevator and this woman, she had never ridden an elevator in her life. She was maybe 60. She was so excited. She was and she said to me, she said, oh, it's so wonderful, look at all this, but I don't know about that restaurant on the top floor because I don't want to pay $40 for a fish with a bone still in it. <laughs> Thank you for your sharing of knowledge. Uh, so I'm gonna share some knowledge. Uh, we have a bomb shelter set. Uh, which is appropriate because I'm going to share some knowledge about the state of the world. Um, so here we go. What's going to happen? There is a calamity in the air. Every person I pass on the street has that look on their face. The look of what's going to happen no matter who you voted for. Everyone has an expression of, everyone hates me. <laughs> it's palpable, like you could scrape its coagulation off the faces and make a stir fry with it. <laughs> it's what my friend actor Stephen Skybell says in the dressing room before each performance to calm himself, what's gonna happen? It's an acknowledgement of anxiety of the elephant in the room. Everything could go wrong. Just voicing the possibility of that would soothe Stephen and me. I've made a part of my ritual now, a little witchy spell. If I acknowledge everything might go wrong, perhaps nothing will. If I acknowledge everything could be a delightful surprise, it might all be. It makes you feel better, I promise. Say it with me. What's gonna happen? <laughs> I recently had the most intense what's gonna happen moment of my art life while the country was having a rather intense what's gonna happen political moment. And still is. For the last five years I've been creating, he said a decade, five years. Um, for the last five years, going six now, I've been creating a show called The 24 Decade History of Popular Music. It is a performance art concert that consists of the performance, deconstruction, and reframing of United States history through popular songs, 246 of them to be exact, all of which were popular in one community or another in the U.S. within the last 240 years, so 1776 to 2016. Researched, arranged, orchestrated, and reimagined, each decade in the U.S. history is given an hour's worth of material. So when added up, you get 24 hours worth of performance. Usually the work is performed in three hour chapters over the course of many nights, but this last October we performed the entire thing from beginning to end non-stop. <laughs> Starting on Saturday at noon, and uh, somebody said, when they, I told them I was doing a 24-hour concert, and they said, that's just selfish. <laughs> <laughs> We're tied to your seat. <laughs> we 
started at Sunday at noon and ended, I started at Saturday at noon and ended on Sunday at noon, one time only. We started in 1776 with an orchestra of 24 musicians, and after every hour we lost a musician until having performed for 23 hours pretty much non-stop, I was on stage alone, left to somehow make my way through the final decade using exhaustion to dream the culture forward, bedazzled and bedraggled. Uh, did I mention the bedazzle? Those photos, we have photos up for people who got here a little early from the show, and so they saw there was lots of bedazzlement. If you got here late, oh well, you have to Google me. <laughs> There's lots of bedazzlement. <laughs> to create the work, we performed it, uh, over and over in shorter sections, and repetition was key because we wanted the audience members to get to know each other over the course of many years. We wanted to build their connection alongside the building of the work. As a theater artist, I'm a community organizer. Therapy. <laughs> I bring people together, that's what I do, I bring people together, I give them some kind of shared experience, not a homogenous one, but a shared one they can use to help as a foundation for further communing. And each time we would perform a section of our show, audience members from previous performances would return. They began to make a ritual out of it. At the shows, I'm always asking audience members to do things, help row a boat across an imagined Atlantic Ocean, slow dance with someone of their same gender, play beer pong with each other. As a result, they get to know the people around them. And they see them again at the next show. They go out after the show for drinks. They start planning the next trip to the show together. The goal was to make something tangible out of an ephemeral art form. And it worked. Friendships were made and or strengthened. Collaborators found each other. Businesses were started by people who met at the shows. More artistic projects were created. I got two wedding invitations <laughs> from people who met at the show. Multiple babies were conceived <laughs> as a result of audience members making love, presumably after the show. <laughs> Working like this also meant uh, we rehearsed very little, but we performed a lot. In hindsight, we used the no theater process where everyone primarily, primarily learns their parts separately and then gets together and makes it <clears throat> for the first time in front of an audience. This meant every single performance had the precision of a, a polished work, but also a major element that had never been done before, never even rehearsed. Stuff like blindfolding an entire audience for an hour of the performance. Using the audience to remove 800 chairs from the space in the length of a short song. And of course in the 24 hour performance, sleep deprivation. How do you rehearse sleep deprivation for an entire audience uh, if you don't have an audience? You strategize and then you make your rehearsal the performance while hoping for the best, what's going to happen. <laughs> Part of the fun is not knowing. But when it came time to put the whole show together, 24 hours of performance, that element of the unknown could be described as stressful. So much money, so many years. I mean, not as much money as you guys spend on your shows, but a lot of money, right? That means you should have like four, my, care, my play here was four characters, a single set, uh, you know, one little intermission, uh, it was two hours at the most, and the budget was bigger than for our big giant show. You know, but that's how it works, on not Broadway. So, so much money, so many years, so much anticipation, so much work, so many hurdles, hurdles of assumptions and logistics, doubt. The fear was that a microcosm of what just happened to Hillary Clinton would happen to us. With the audience members who'd been with us from the beginning shrug and say, well, I guess all that time we put into watching this show didn't ultimately amount to anything. With the people who hadn't been with us the whole way, and each performance was primarily made of people new to the project, would they get it? Would they recognize how much work had gone into the piece? Or because of its uniqueness, 
Would it get equated with anything else off? Would we get equated to the queen down the street who lip syncs badly to the latest pop craze? Or the cabaret performer who sang 10 songs and told stories about their famous friends? Like our political climate, would it get all normalized through our need to dismiss anything that is extraordinary, like progressive action, and replace it with that which is accessible, like nostalgia? Worst of all, if we failed, would that become the topic of conversation, our failure, rather than the ideas in the work? And there were ideas. <laughs> ideas that involved the excavation of alternative history. Ideas about using identity politics as the reference for contextualization without making them the point. Ideas about minorities becoming the metaphor for America instead of its niche. Ideas about how drag is what you look like on the inside, worn on the outside. Ideas that involve humility existing in authority through questions, but not a relentless cynical questioning. Not through cynicism's reign, but through its incorporation and in play. Ideas that are free of the Puritan dominance over expression. Ideas about turning the harmful into catharsis. 240 years worth of ideas. But would I even be able to sing past hour 15? <laughs> I thought it was possible, but not likely. <laughs> We'd been marathon training. We started with 90-minute shows, went to two-hour, three-hour ones, five, six. Last July, we performed a 12-hour workshop, just half the show, and the most we would ever perform of it until the full 24-hour work. When the 12-hour workshop was over, I thought, I might have another three hours in me, but truly, more than that seemed unlikely. What was I thinking? If I couldn't keep going past hour 15, what was, what was I going to do with the remaining nine hours of performance? <laughs> My voice teacher had warned me that I might have a vocal hemorrhage, in which case it was strongly advised I stop. Would the final nine hours suddenly become one big audience karaoke night? I knew I wouldn't want to have to sit through that. <laughs> Reducing the work to a durational art party. That would be making the extraordinary act of progression an act of accessibility, of nostalgia. It was not the vision. Falling apart was the vision. It was in some ways the whole point. The work, when put together in its entirety, is about how communities build themselves as a result of being torn apart. We, the audience, technicians, and performers, we're all going to put ourselves through 24 hours, staying up, little to no sleep, watching and listening an immersive narrative, an onslaught of music, relentlessly moving forward, all that American history on our backs. But as a result of going through it together, our exhaustion, we would be building bonds. Dramaturgically, each decade we focused on was about a different community in America, which was built as a result of falling apart. Those of us who were experiencing the 24-hour period together would be lunging towards those communities. Our experience would be a way to see them and their struggles in a different light. Perhaps then we would be able to take that experience and use it to give aid to other communities going through similar trials. It's important to know that the work is intended to help people. It was not about communities going extinct as a result of being torn apart. It was about them building themselves. So somehow I did have to make my way and help the audience make their way to hour 24. We would need to keep the wonder of possibility alive in our bodies for 24 hours. What's gonna happen? <laughs> the afternoon of the performance, the art audience started screaming and applauding the second the house lights began to dim. <laughs> this was our crowd. <laughs> Most of them had been with us for multiple years, and they weren't here to decide whether they would like it. Most everyone knew we weren't making something accessible, but extraordinary. They'd been making it with us, and they were going to continue doing so. 
The first hour was all about a colony trying to build itself into something new while it was being torn apart by colonization. And it was great. My voice felt strong despite the cold I'd gotten the day before. <laughs> the orchestra was on point. My jokes were landing. The ideas were clear. Everything went, you know, everything we have been working towards was happening in the room except one element, the element of calamity of what's going to happen. We did such a good job at polishing our show that we've taken the danger out of the room. It's not that the circumstances of us performing for 24 hours had suddenly been resolved. Everybody knew everything could fall apart, but we had created an environment where nobody expected it to happen for at least another 12 hours. <laughs> so we were resting in a way. But that's when the dry ice spilled. It happened in hour two, 1786 to 1796. 23 hours still to go. The decade is dedicated to the start of the women's live movement in the United States and focuses on a housewife who wants to be more than a housewife. The outfit for the decade consists of two giant smokestacks. Steam engines were invented in the 1780s, so our divine madness costume designer, whose name is Machine, <laughs> he, wanted, yeah, machine. he wanted smokestacks, and he wanted them to smoke. <laughs> Dry ice was the solution, and it was wonderful, but when it came time to take the smokestacks off in the second song of the second decade, water spilled all over the stage. Not such a big deal. Just a puddle of water on the stage, easily clean. But it was the first hint at the possibility of calamity. <laughs> How would we build ourselves because of the spill? In the moment, I did it through humor, through making the character of the decade the housewife I was portraying add to the injustice of her circumstance by having to clean up the mess. <laughs> it was a funny improv, and more so because of its dramaturgical appropriateness. <laughs> But more importantly, it was the moment we'd all been waiting for, calamity and our ability to incorporate calamity to overcome an oppression. We weren't going to ignore the flaw and let it sit there while we continue to hit our marks. We were going to be people who transform obstacles, making the world we want based on a learning and openness to the world that is. It's so much fun being like that. <laughs> so much better than simply accepting, denying, or commenting on the world that is. To clarify, the world that I want is not utopian. It has obstacles, water spills, a glued on eyebrow falls off. <laughs> Revolutions are halted by the musical director's brief lapse in memory. <laughs> Overuse brings change. Vocal cords swell, leaving you sounding like Hermione Gingle. <laughs> I've given this speech before, and it was at an arts presenter's uh, space, and they didn't get that joke. <laughs> theater people get the joke. <laughs> At least the old ones. <laughs> it's fun opening your mouth. It's fun opening your mouth and sounding like a different person. I sound like I'm on a big mouth. It's fun letting the world change you and then change you again. One thing I noticed in terms of the audience at the 24-hour performance was fatigue began to build a little defensiveness in them, but more fatigue dismantled the defense the original fatigue had built. The audience became deranged in their emotional availability. <laughs> you don't get to experience that heightened degree of openness to see what you're capable of if you design your life around comfort and polish. It was good. And as a result, people keep asking me that question. What's next? <laughs> Retirement, motherfuckers. <laughs> Not retirement. What was next is that two weeks after the two weeks after the 24-hour performance, we went back on the road. 
to Northern Ireland to perform the decades of 1906 to 1926 in the Ulster Bank Belfast International Arts Festival. I wanted to be in Belfast, but I'd never performed in Northern Ireland before, and I couldn't figure out a way into the first audience there. They were almost the polar opposite of the 24-hour show audience we had just had in New York. Their arms were crossed before we even begun, eyebrows were raised, they were guarded instead of game. I would have to do what I usually do when I'm on the road in a new place and spontaneously change things in the show to win them over to open them up to a different kind of theater from what they're used to, or what they think is supposed to happen. And usually that's fun, incorporating the calamity. But two weeks before I performed, uh, but two, weeks, I, two weeks before I had performed a 24-hour performance, which had made all those progressive intentions tangible. And performing in Belfast was like starting at the beginning. It was like going on a first date even though you'd met the love of your life two weeks before. <laughs> you don't want to cancel the date because it was set up before you met your love, <laughs> but your heart is somewhere else. <laughs> Plus, they named their festival after a bank. <laughs> making fun of me, <laughs> laughing in the wrong places. <laughs> when I asked all the women in the audience to sing at a, along at a certain point, a male voice rang out louder than all the women's <laughs> in what seemed to be like a mocking tone. <laughs> Off-key, obnoxious. I thought I should take him on. This is sexism and homophobia. I've experienced this before, straight men who act out because they're uncomfortable with not being the lead in the story. <laughs> so they heckle. I call him our heckler in chief. They heckle or throw things. They throw things sometimes. My philosophy is if something is threatening to take the story away from the storyteller, then at all costs you have to incorporate that threatening thing into the story. And usually that manifests itself in the form of a quick response, something like, if an audience member is verbally offended by my liberal politics, which happens, I'll gesture to my drag, I wear the drag, and I say, what about this, says false advertising. <laughs> Pointing out the ridiculousness of the obvious usually works. Sometimes the heckler's anonymity needs to be taken away from them, so the spot gets put on them. As my drag mother, Mother Flawless Sabrina, once said to me about some homophobes who saw her walking down the street and proceeded to pull out a gun and shoot her, and she survived. But when I said to her, oh, those horrible, horrible men, she said, no, Taylor, no, they're not horrible. They just wanted to be part of the show. <laughs> so you make the heckler part of the show. Not the lead. <laughs> but part of it. The homophobe gets brought up on stage and I'll work that freaking homophobe until he is making out with me. <laughs> or singing a duet with me or wearing my costume. I try to make it fun. Every night you go out on stage hoping it will be a comedy, but sometimes it turns into a tragedy. Sometimes the calamity wins. That is the art in the room. Then the challenge is how to make everyone see that the tragedy is the art. How to direct the purpose by making the obstacle the thing that brings us all together. So in Belfast, I thought I should take on that guy who's mocking our show. But two weeks before, I finished a 24-hour performance and I was tired. <laughs> so against my philosophy, I ignored it and kept the show going. But there's a moment in the decade we were performing that I'm particularly fond of. It's a reading of the last page of James Joyce's Ulysses. It's certainly one of the more beautiful passages of any piece of literature, and I love using it 
as an example of something reaching beauty because it goes on longer than it should. <laughs> Sometimes while reading it, I hear people sobbing. But in Belfast, a woman could not stop laughing, which is fine. But all the way through the reading, and it was one of those laughs that become the story of the room and leave no room for any others to have their story, which is not fine. The sound was coming from the same direction as the guy who was mocking me earlier. They all seemed to be part of a group who were angry that a queen was taking space. People had warned me how homophobic Belfast is. It was like this Polish presenter who wanted me to uh, who wanted to take me on an Eastern European tour and to entice me, he said, uh, you will sleep on floors. You won't get paid anything. People will try to kill you. It will be fabulous. <laughs> and I said, listen, I'm totally game for a good cause to do two out of those three, but not all three. <laughs> that is where I draw the line. And here in Belfast, in the final moments of a two-hour performance, this is where I was going to draw the line. I couldn't let that woman ruin Molly Bloom, ruin all her yeses with her no. So I asked for the house lights. And slowly, with laser precision, I made my way up the steps to the laughing woman. The audience held their collective breaths. Her laughter became hysterical. I climbed to her over her community of homophobes, <laughs> one after another. There was only one song left in the show, a medley. It, was, it starts with, when the red, red rum goes bebop bobbing along. And she is laughing like this. <laughs> She laughs, I hold her, I sing slow. When the red, red robin goes beba, she laughs. I repeat, she laughs. I stay and with her and repeat the opening line of the song over and over again and again until her laughter calms. Laughter has a limit. It will tire itself out eventually. You just have to be willing to exhaust it. So that's what I did. Eventually, she was still. Some other things happened, but the evening ended with her feeding me cake on stage from her fingers and a great tr triumphant company bow, her just off center, <laughs> bowing with us. I felt vindicated. It wasn't until after the show that I found out she was a special needs person. In fact, the entire back section of the audience were all special needs. Nobody from the festival told me there was a busload of special needs in the audience because they didn't know the special needs people that were last ticket buyers. They all showed up at once. So I didn't know, they didn't know. And that guy who was mocking me, singing in a weird off-key voice, he wasn't mocking me. He was singing. I had in my mind created the entire conflict. The audience loved the show, but my assumptions and past hurts had framed the current circumstance away from truth. My mom passed away two days after the election. And when I got home from Belfast, I immediately had to fly to her home in Orange County, California, because it had become clear that she wasn't going to be able to take care of herself anymore. She'd been sick with breast cancer for some time. She'd been hiding it. We knew something was wrong. She'd lost a lot of weight, her hands shook. I thought it was Parkinson's, but I didn't know because we couldn't get a doctor's prognosis. She was a Christian scientist, which means she didn't go to the doctors. She believed everything spiritual is the truth and everything material is a lie. I would joke with her, everything? She never got the joke. <laughs> <laughs> to her, there was nothing funny about her religion, which to me is kind of funny. <laughs> because matter, matter was a lie to her. Her illness was a lie. 
She couldn't have cancer. To her, calamity simply didn't exist. Could God get cancer? No. But are you God, Mom? No, but the Bible says I'm God's perfect image and likeness. And God is perfect, so that must mean I'm perfect as well. Can God get cancer? No. Then I can't get it either. That was the philosophy I grew up with. It's not what I believe now. I left the religion when I was 14. And I want to be clear, my mother's interpretation of Christian science is not the only way to practice the religion. It's just mind over matter. It's not that big deal. All philosophies have practitioners who take things to extremes, who leave no room for relativism. And my mom was one of those people. She was in it. She believed and preached like an authoritarian, but not like an author. An author who has authority questions they get their specialized knowledge through an admission of doubt and the practice of incorporating doubt into considerations. But my mom's version of her religion, it didn't work if you welcomed in doubt. To doubt or question would be tantamount to destroying her medication. If you acknowledge the cancer, the calamity, you'd feed it. If I brought doubt with me from her perspective, I would essentially be responsible for her death. <laughs> So we played a game. She wouldn't acknowledge what was happening to her, and I wouldn't take her power away from her by forcing that acknowledgement on her so as not to be responsible for what was happening to her. As heartbreaking as it was to see her suffer, she did the whole thing without painkillers. It was remarkable to watch someone commit to their belief system regardless of pain, regardless that all the facts were dismantling those beliefs left and right, especially during the election. I began to see her commitment and obstinacy as, again, a metaphor for the political landscape, for climate change deniers, Hillary demoniers, demonizers, Trump apologists, and left-wing arrogance and naivete. She believed the only way to heal was to reframe facts as falsehoods. Everything material is a lie and everything spiritual is the truth. Everything? No laugh. No medicine meant there weren't any professionals to help, so hospice work was left to my sister and I. And we fumbled our way through it and did okay, but there were times when having a professional to share their authority with us, even a little, would have solved a lot of problems and brought more grace. I started singing her to sleep to ease the panic that was building up from both of us. There was a wonder at having 246 songs to pull from. <laughs> Despite her conservative politics, she never missed seeing a new work of mine. She budgeted her yearly expenses around being able to fly across the country to see them. But because of the illness, she wasn't able to come to the 24-hour performance, and I knew it upset her. So at one point, I decided to start working my way through the show, <coughs> describing what we did decade by decade and singing the songs in each one. Normally, I would incorporate her illness into the work. It was the elephant in the room, and incorporating the elephant is how I do things. But here, I couldn't do that without becoming responsible for the illness. We got through about half the show a little bit at a time, cutting the more lascivious political or ruckus songs <laughs> and emphasizing the lullabies, love songs, and hymns, sentimentalizing and editing for mom. Like all sentimental things that go on too long, it started to become an exercise in nostalgia instead of progression. Listening began to hurt more than help. Working to ignore the pain in the room hurt us too much. The day she died, she had a visit from a Christian science nurse. And this isn't a nurse who has medical training, but someone who will sit and pray with you, give you a bed bath, and at the most, change a bandage. The woman was dear, if a little much. She gave my mom some advice. Joy, my mom's name was Joy. Joy. If everyone says there's an elephant in this room and they want you to acknowledge the elephant, do you acknowledge the elephant? Or do you get smart and realize there isn't an elephant in this room? 
She was essentially saying my mom's re religious ideology was right. If she acknowledged the cancer, she would feed it. But the tactic she used to prove her point was to interpret the metaphor of the elephant literally. <laughs> she was invalidating the artistic expression of a metaphor in order to disprove a fact. She was saying my mom wasn't going to die. She was going to have a healing because there wasn't an actual elephant in the room. <laughs> and unsurprisingly, this validation made my mom happy for a few seconds on the day she died. And because at that point there wasn't any use in doing anything other than what little we could to make her happy, I didn't debate the literal use of the metaphor. <laughs> then, I saved it for what's next, for what's gonna happen, because my mom did die. Because true, there wasn't an actual elephant in the room, but there was a large tumor. And we, in this room, are not on our deathbeds. Sure, we will be one day, some sooner than others, but not today. That means we don't get to pretend. We believe art is going to change the world, that we can simply imagine our vision and it will happen, but so did my mom. So do climate change deniers and those committed to nostalgia. The facts show us, living in a chimera, it doesn't work. No matter how many metaphors we dismantle to convince us otherwise, we do have to grapple with calamity. But how? How will we summon the energy after all of this? What's gonna happen? What's next? I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll share my knowledge. <laughs> economy. Mm. Theater audiences will say you. You will burst into spontaneous applause before the work has even begun. That's how. You'll do this because you'll be part of the process of making the work. As a result, you'll know that each performance is a special day unlike any other. You will greet the new work the way you would a newborn baby. No matter how tired you are, when you see a newborn baby, you put your stretched fingers out to hold it if it's not crying. <laughs> so do the same at the start of a show. Make it your ritual. That's what's next. You will delight in the possibility. You will commit to its natural wonder and intelligence. Become teary-eyed while cradling it, simply because it exists and is sharing space because it is vulnerable, because it is a little bit of you and so much of itself, because it needs you. You will be committed in it, game, there to consider rather than decide. You will start the ritual with an embrace and love it before it even begins. What's next is theater will be a place for communion rather than competition. This will be happen because our creations will no longer conclude or peak with epiphany. There will be no closure, no implication that things finish, that a character or idea or show is frozen, ready to be repeated exactly, night after night, like an assembly line, which dehumanizes the communal experience. What's next is theater won't ask permission to participate in the creativity of its own survival. It will not gatekeep itself. It will simply make. What's next is theater will see naming rights for what they are. Those with power pissing on the culture instead of participating with it. Nobody will get an above the title credit. <laughs> not the producers, not the quote unquote not for profit institution that first produced the work. And not the artists. This will give you energy to grapple with what's going to happen because you won't spend your energy on legal paperwork. <laughs> Furthermore, all theaters and festivals will change their names from patrons and banks and corporations to verbs and adverbs. <laughs> the David Koch Theater will be rechristened the Trickle Up. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted just walking into a theater called the David Koch Theater. <laughs> Imagine how fun it would be if you walked into a space called the Trickle Up. <laughs> don't mind if I do. <laughs> I'm sure whoever 
this building is named after is very nice. <laughs> <laughs> What's next is theater will stop trying to be a plutocracy, autocracy, which is different from authority, or even a democracy. And instead, it will be made by people with authority. Remember authority? Not the kind where one person has power over another, but the kind where one person has knowledge and experience in a field or subject because they make a continuous commitment to learning about that subject. And, if you, actu and you actually listen to what that person has to say and trust their authority. Trust with an open mind towards learning more, but trust. It seems to me our political problems lie somewhere in the confusion between the two definitions of authority. While trying to stop someone from having power over you, you decided nobody knows more than you. But I progress. <laughs> so many opinions I have. <laughs> What's next is a ritual sacrifice of opinion. <laughs> Theater will be a vaccination to the plague of opinions. Audiences, critics, and artists will make a commitment to perpetual consideration because we'll convince them it is a place, the theater is a place that is a respite from decision making. They will flock to plays and live performance in order to be free of opinion. In the future, audiences will get specific with description. They will learn to discuss art through consideration rather than likes and dislikes, agreement and disagreement. They'll do this because artists, administrators, and producers will set the example and do it themselves. What's next is theater will be America's weapon of choice. Because when they get rid of that NEA, we're going to steal the money from the military. <laughs> Convince them, in order to make us safe, they have to produce my play. <laughs> it will be this way. It will, theater will be America's weapon of choice because we will make theater a place where young men and women without means can get a free education and degree simply by going to and participating in the theater. Plus, they'll be able to use their bodies at the theater. Everyone's like, why? <laughs> so, I don't understand how that will work. Make it happen. They'll run. They'll be able to use their bodies at the theater. They'll run and jump and hurdle while experiencing the ideas in theater. They won't sign up for the military to do those things because they'll get it out while being audience members. <laughs> What's next is all work will last at least as long as your 40-hour work week. Not less, more. Not shorter, longer. Not reduction, but expansion. Does that mean no minimalism? No. Minimalism is a part of the full expression of who we are. So, I love minimalism. Let me see the tree for the forest ever so often. But when living in a culture that allows a brander to become president, you must protest the tools of reduction. Write that down, marketing people. <laughs> What's next is all work will last at least as, oh, I said this. No, yes, I said that. I'm going to say it again. <laughs> Next is all work will last at least as long as your 40 hour work week. <laughs> What's next is all the work of minorities will be on your main stage. Fuck your black box. <laughs> I love them, they're sweet. I'm sure they're named after a very nice person. <laughs> Thanks for having me in them. Thank you for having me in them, but fuck your, fuck your black box. I mean, every time you put a minority's voice in the black box, you aren't giving them a voice, but making sure the majority is in charge of them, able to frame them as less than or challenging. You are creating intimacy, but hierarchy. Look, I mean, for the most part, minorities are way more expressive than majorities. That's how we function in a world that isn't interested in seeing us. You're not interested in seeing me? I'm gonna get louder. <laughs> so if this is true, and it is, it is on our largest stages that the work of minorities makes sense. We know how to fill the big theater. It is there our work won't suffocate and become squashed into the intimacy 
of the privilege of subtlety. I said it. Subtlety is a privilege. <laughs> What's next is theater will be brave enough to talk about the subject rather than around the subject. Have you noticed this trend in the theater? They don't like to go at the subject. They're like, we'll just talk around it. And then everyone will be like, it was so good. They didn't actually talk about it anymore. <laughs> will be seen as cowardice. It will not be confused with authenticity. It will be seen as a casualty of anti-intellectualism. Extravagance will be seen not as indulgence or a lie, but as an expression of that which is normally hidden, dismissed, or buried, as a path towards our collective authority. Some high-end artistic director who has never booked me at his high-end New York theater, even though I've been making objectively thrilling work in New York for 20 years, <laughs> said a 24-decade worked because it was the right timing for it, that people weren't cynical now, so they could embrace it. No, queen, the show worked because the theater booked it. <laughs> If you had booked it 20 years ago on the main stage, it would have worked then as well. Uh, uh, uh. What's next is there will be no auditions, no submissions, no pitches, zero networking. <laughs> we will find each other when we see each other's work. We will find each other because we are making, working, and participating. What's next is we will live by example. We'll stop telling people their party isn't fun and instead create a kick-ass party that everyone will want to go to. And more importantly, that everyone is invited to. Not that everyone is in control of, but that everybody is invited to. The radical queer community and history we showed in a 24 decade history of popular music wasn't a wish for how the world could be. It wasn't chimera, it was a reveal my drag isn't a costume I use to hide in. It's exposing what I look like on the inside. This is what I look like when I want to hide. <laughs> Likewise, our art, what's next for it, is not a wish, but a discovery. What's next is we'll know when the emails are being used as a distraction. We'll check ourselves when we start to allow past hurts to frame our current circumstance away from truth. We'll hone our observation skills so we're aware that the back section of the audience is filled with patrons who are special needs. We'll keep showing up again and again, no matter how tired, because we are tired. We'll use our exhaustion to keep the wonderment of possibilities in our bodies. We'll use forms where our art can be more than an imagining, but an actual manifestation. We'll build an authority from considering the world as it changes. We'll acknowledge the calamity without feeding it. We will instead transform calamity into communion. We will make a ritual out of the wonderment of what's going to happen. 